I had initially intended the video you're watching to be a three-part response to Metatron's video on the same topic, and this still is. However, after letting the first part sit for a few months, I've decided to revamp everything, and it is now complete. Longbow vs. Crossbow is one of those eternal debates you'll see not only on YouTube, but also on internet forums and other hubs of popular history. This is something, though, that has also been an issue since the Hundred Years' War, with French and English sources from the period describing each weapon as either superior or inferior to each other based on national biases. What I'll be doing in this series is delving into the topic in order to determine, or attempt to determine, anyway, how longbows and crossbows actually compare. In order to do that, I'm marshalling a great deal of literature, including a recent PhD thesis on this very subject, which means that the research in this series will be, hopefully, at the cutting edge. To do this correctly, there are a series of interrelated things we need to talk about. The first would be the historiography of the subject, in order to establish where scholarship currently stands and how it can be improved in the future. The second would be the actual development of the longbow, Thirdly, the development of the crossbow. We will also need to talk about longbows and crossbows as depicted in medieval art, as well as some of the more famous battles where longbowmen and crossbowmen dueled in the field. Lastly, a method for legitimate comparison needs to be developed, which poses its own set of problems. So with all of this said, we have our task set out before us in these videos, so let's get started. In his The Art of War in the Middle Ages, a remarkably influential book published in 1895, Charles Oman set up the argument that archery, as an influence on the battlefield, peaked during the Hundred Years' War. According to Oman, this was an age when massed units of archers and other dismounted infantry like spearmen, when supporting each other, were able to fully counter the charges of heavily armored knights and other forms of cavalry. Oman's argument, additionally, was that the key ranged weapon in this late medieval military revolution was the longbow. According to him, the longbow was something the English troops came up against constantly during Edward I's Welsh campaigns, and in the aftermath of the conquest, the English were so impressed with the weapon's performance that they began to not only bring Welsh archers into their armies in greater numbers, but they also began to adopt the longbow themselves. In contrast to this, the continental European armies did not use the longbow, but instead the crossbow, and so they were on the losing end of this military revolution. His arguments, while challenged, have set the basis for a lot of the understanding of medieval warfare, and over time, they've seeped down into the broader levels of society, while current scholarship has not necessarily done so. His arguments about the longbow, that it was superior to the crossbow, something evidenced by Richard I favoring the crossbow, and not the longbow because he didn't know about the longbow, because why would you like a supposedly inferior weapon if you had the option of a better one, is an example of this. Another example would be Oman's interest in the tactics of the English longbowmen at the battles of Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt. For him, the massed archer formations are what won the battles. J. E. Morris had a slightly different view. While Oman discussed ideas about the longbow originating from Wales, he also argued for a North England origin. Morris, though, came down very strongly on the side of the Welsh. Drawing on an 11th century source, the Tour of Wales, Morris took the description of bows in the text at its word and argued that the Welsh bows, with stronger penetrating power, were the very same weapons utilized by the English during the Hundred Years' War. According to Morris, the English armies adopt the bow either during or after Edward I's Welsh campaigns, and then they use it in the conquest of Ireland. He does not, however, argue for mass adoption prior to about 1270. From his perspective, it's only something that occurred gradually, eventually culminating in the Scottish Wars and then in the battles in France. The core problem with much of Morris's work, though, is that he was attempting to explain English dominance on the field in France by way of archery, and because of that, he was projecting backwards from the 14th century looking for answers. Because of this, quite a lot of his work gives very strong treatment to the longbow and not nearly so much to the crossbow, since the English did not use it very much during the Hundred Years' War, and, therefore, it did not really matter in his discussion. This was all at the turn of the 20th century. There really was not too much done until about the 1950s and 60s on the subject of longbows and crossbows, and it's at this point that the subjects basically diverged. Oman and Morris discussed both, but by and large, 
By the middle of the 20th century, the discussions were either of one weapon or the other. The first three key works from this period, Featherstone's The Bowmen of England, Oakshot's The Archaeology of Weapons, and Blair's European Armor, need to be taken together. Oakshot's book is primarily concerned with swords and other melee weaponry, but he does discuss archery briefly. Specifically, what he notices is that the changes in armor technology from mail to predominantly plate occurs around the same time as the mass adoption of longbows by the English armies, and he sees the two points as related, and it's a point that Blair picks up on and reinforces. Featherstone's book takes these points and writes them into a work aimed at a general audience, with the result being that the notion of a longbow revolution, or something to that effect, now enters the popular consciousness. Following these three, the next crucial work for longbow historiography was Hardy's The Longbow, A Social and Military History, published in 1978. In this book, Hardy re-examined the Bayer Tapestry and he rejected Morris's argument that it showed the Normans with only shorter, weaker bows. What he argued instead was that, since there were archers in the corner of the tapestry, with what appear to be longer bows than the main archers in the center of the piece, this was evidence for the Normans using longer bows than previously supposed. According to Hardy, much of Europe still used the crossbow in the High Middle Ages, so what happened in England is a marrying of Norman predisposition to bows with Welsh superior technology. Some Welsh texts from the 1100s mention that bows were not made of yew, so what matters, as far as Hardy is concerned, is that the Normans introduced the notion of using yew, and this, combined with the already superior Welsh weapons, was the yew longbow which so decimated the French during the Hundred Years' War. Any discussion of this book and its arguments, though, needs to be treated with an extreme degree of caution, because the footnotes are basically non-existent and the bibliography is a page and a half so it's not certain where he was getting all of his information. The Medieval Archer, by Jim Bradbury, is the first work that attempts to break free from the predominant argument that the longbow originates in Wales. Bradbury's work rejected the notion that the weapon had Welsh origins, and he also rejected the notion that the predominant form of European bow during the early and high medieval period was the short bow, instead arguing that the predominant ranged weapon had been the composite bow. He backs this up by arguing that, since the Bayer Tapestry depicts many of the archers holding their arrows incorrectly, the artists were not as familiar with archery as was once supposed, and thus we should not read the source literally, and that, because both were made from a single stave, there was no crucial difference between the typical shortbow and the later longbow. He points out that, given the issues with medieval art, physical evidence is the crucial factor for an investigation into longbows, and because we have surviving examples of what appear to fit that description from both Ireland and Denmark prior to the supposed mass adoption by England, it was not a new technology. This was a major shift in the discussion, but despite it, there are still those who argue strongly for a Welsh origin and for its effectiveness in the spirit of Oman and Morris. Chiefly among those who argue in this manner is Clifford Rogers, but he is not without his rivals. Kelly de Vries has been less concerned with the origin of the weapon and more concerned with the battlefield efficacy of it. Primarily, de Vries has been concerned with what he views as technological determinism, the notion that it is technology, and technology alone, that wins battles. He contends, and very strongly I might add, in infantry warfare in the early 14th century, discipline, tactics, and technology, that while the longbow did play a role on the field, Attributing English victories to the weapon alone are misguided. Its primary purpose was to function as a support weapon on the field, loosing arrows constantly and breaking up enemy formations. Rogers, on the other hand, has fought against de Vries's assertions, specifically in an article titled The Efficacy of the Longbow, a reply to Kelly de Vries, in which he directly calls him out. Pushing back against the idea that the bow is primarily a support weapon, and also against the idea that the longbow is not a new weapon, his most recent work depends heavily on semantics and working the definitions of bows to get at the heart of what the longbow really was. Contending that you can see the bows in medieval art grow larger as we approach the 14th century, and also noting that some textual sources explicitly use the term longbow, he shifted the discussion back to an evolutionary track. What I hope you're getting from this is that defining the longbow is difficult, and we'll talk more about why that is in later videos.
Now for the crossbow literature. Much of the work done on the medieval crossbow is actually not in English. I suppose this is not all that surprising, as English language scholarship has tended to focus much more heavily on the longbow. Published originally in Swedish in 1947, Joseph Alm's European Crossbows, a survey, is just over 100 pages in length and attempts to survey crossbows between about 1000 and 1600, with a preference to later centuries. It doesn't focus on battles very much or on any kind of comparison to longbows, but rather focuses heavily on how the weapons were built. In it, he predominantly dated the composite crossbows to the 12th century and the more famous steel crossbows to the 14th century. However, while this still remains a strong work, it should be used with care as its discussion tends more towards the crossbows of Central Europe. We get a little more detail with Patterson, A Guide to the Crossbow, and while it is a great source for discussions of the evolution and the development of firing mechanisms, it's a bit disjointed, largely being comprised of Patterson's notes. Holgen Richter's work, published in 2006, is the most up-to-date discussion of composite crossbows. His work not only dissects the weapons and examines where their power comes from, in terms of the physics of archery, but it also adds to the discussion on their origin, arguing for an Islamic origin of the weapon. It does not necessarily revolutionize our understanding of the weapon, but it does add a fair amount of detail to our knowledge, although it must be said that many of the conclusions need more work but we just don't have tons of evidence surviving. Arguably, though, the most important work on crossbows is the Granson Catalog. The Granson Catalog is several hundred pages long, but unfortunately for any discussion of crossbows, it remains unpublished, only able to be viewed if you physically go to Granson Castle in Switzerland. Now, there is always more to be said, and always more research being conducted, but this, generally, is a brief overview of the literature on both subjects.